this week in Jamaica now. Almost there, mother aboard Adventure of the Seas seeks to comfort twin boys as ship finally docks in Jamaica. But a pregnant woman on the ship is in anguish after losing her child. Why wasn't she evacuated by helicopter? Salary cut and payment delays, COVID crunch squeezing two Jamaican universities. Press freedom fighter and media mogul Oliver Clark has died. And when you hear um, a shot go off, I was still looking, 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 but they didn't, they didn't kill my sons yet. Tivoli, 10 years after the bloody incursion. I'm Damian Mitchell, and this is Jamaica Now. It's been a slow countdown for twin boys LeBron and London James, anxious for the reunion with their mother, Samoy Fraser, now aboard the Adventure of the Seas docked in Falmouth, Trelawney. The ship arrived around noon on Tuesday, ending days of uncertainty as pressure mounted on the government to grant approval for its arrival with 1,044 Jamaicans on board. Fraser was among the workers on the vessel seeking to console loved ones that she is okay. On Thursday, Tremaine James took their twin boys to the Falmouth Historic Pair for a second day to see the vessel from which their mom had been sending them assurances that she will be home soon. But the ship is stuck over by the pier. And I'm coming very soon, okay? I love you. I miss you. Where's Lebron? Lebron, how are you? How are you? I miss you. I miss you so much. And I'll see you very soon, okay? Ship workers have been disembarking the vessel in batches since Thursday. On leaving the vessel, they are tested for COVID-19 and then transported to the Bahia Principe Hotel for quarantine. Those tested negative will be released to go home to complete their 14 days in quarantine, while those positive will be transferred to a state facility for isolation. In the meantime, Jamaican health authorities have sought to explain why a pregnant woman on board the ship was not evacuated by helicopter as the vessel lingered in Haitian waters awaiting approval to enter Jamaican maritime space. The captain had announced the medical emergency on Monday afternoon. To uh, evacuate one crew member, the evacuation will be carried out by helicopter and uh, we might turn the ship and proceed towards the, Q uh, the Jamaican uh, coast in order to uh, get it within the reach of the helicopter. That same evening, Prime Minister Andrew Holness announced that the government had now granted permission for the Adventure of the Seas to arrive in Jamaica at noon the following day. Eighteen hours after the Prime Minister's announcement, the vessel arrived at the Falmouth Pier and the pregnant woman was immediately disembarked and taken to hospital. She lost the child. Health authorities have sought to explain that the helicopter evacuation had become unnecessary. On review of the, the medical report, it was agreed that the person um, the condition could have um, was stable enough to allow for the ship to arrive and for the safe disembarkation of the person. The Northern Caribbean University, NCU, has announced a 10% salary cut for all its employees effective June 1 amid reduced revenue inflows caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. NCU says further salary reduction is pending if the institution's financial position does not improve to meet future payments. Meanwhile, the University of the West Indies Mona did not pay staff as expected on Friday. The UWI Mona says this is because the COVID crisis has compounded its economic woes. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister has announced that the work-from-home order will be lifted come June 1 as the government seeks to reopen the economy. So I want you to consider this announcement as notice that this will be done. During this notice period, the PSOJ working through the Economic Recovery Committee will, in collaboration with the government, will finalize what the, the new workplace protocols should look like. The announcement of the gradual reopening of the economy comes amid slowing down in the rate of confirmed COVID-19 cases and a reduction in the number of active cases as more patients recover. There has been an outpouring of tributes for former RJ Aglina Group Chairman Oliver Clark, who died on Saturday night at the age of 75. He had cancer. Government, civic and business leaders have expressed sadness and hailed his contribution to press freedom and media management. I was one of those members who appeared before him uh, on behalf of the Senate, uh, Mr. President. 
and I tell you, he <laughs> okay. He was shocked and appalled to hear and learn of the circumstances under which the um, parliamentarian, parliamentarians were operating. And you know, he made some very strong recommendations for corrective actions. He was a great man. He'll be well remembered. Meanwhile, in a three-page remembrance posted on her Facebook page, Clark's only daughter, Alexandra, said there would be no formal ceremony for her father. She said she and her mother, Monica, had decided that an alternative amid the current global pandemic would not bring closure for them. Alexandra has also asked for contributions to the mustard seed communities and missionaries of the poor to continue the philanthropy that was a priority for her father over the years. It's been 10 years now since the infamous Tivoli Gardens operations in the hunt for then-fugitive Christopher Dudas Koch. 68 civilians and one soldier were killed in the operation, which also resulted in a shutdown of the corporate area for days and a month-long hunt for Koch. A decade later, at least two state agencies say the search for answers about how the dozens of West Kingston residents perished in the incursion have been doomed by botched police investigations from the outset. However, both the Independent Commission of Investigations and the Office of the Public Defender have avoided questions about whether the missteps by police investigators 10 years ago were deliberate. Meanwhile, the pain remains fresh for some of the residents who lost loved ones in the incursion. A policeman shot that little boy. He was in a grey marina. When they shot that little boy, my cousin was the one who had to jump out of the truck and lift up that body show him in the truck and the rest of the dead body my brother was in the truck with dead bodies 14 years old you see you're coming from the doctor today for the same injuries from 2020 yeah for 2020 here a sick he is affect me a minute drop down with me but you sick and encourage that and my food and told them give me and you were promised how much 14 million and my girl around me and I go around me and I go around me they keep sending us going inside, and go inside and hear when the bullet go off. Yeah, when I when you hear the, um, a shot go off, I was still looking, 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 but they did they, they, they didn't kill my sons yet. And I saw them came outside with him, with him into a sheet and placed him across the road. The sheet blew off. I could identify him face and see him. At that time, I was so traumatized. I said they was going to kill my two sons if they kill Kevin and Kevin don't do anything. So I keep looking, 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 looking at but I saw when they were coming with the two of them and they placed them inside the garden next door to me. Not him. And 40 years after 153 old and destitute women died in the infamous Edentide fire, they were this week memorialized by a group including three retirees. The eventide women, some blind and many physically handicapped, were sleeping when the fire broke out. Some were buried by their relatives. However, according to a May 27, 1980 article in the Gleaner, the charred remains of 145 of the victims of the May 20 fire at the eventide home in Kingston were buried in 26 wooden coffins in a single grave at the National Heroes Park. Broadcaster Faye Ellington captured the memories back in 1985 in a documentary she produced for the final year project as a student at the Caribbean Institute of Media and Communication. It took me weeks to, to really come to myself. I couldn't eat any flesh from having seen what fire can do to a human body. I'm used to, for example, dealing, handling parts of people whom I knew <laughs> in autopsies. But to this day, I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's something that will really never leave my, my mind. I have this picture uh, of, you know, unrecognizable corpses that are shrunk to half the size from the heat, you know, skulls being split open from the temperature. There has been anguish in the St. James community of Gordon Crescent in Granville following a deadly crash along the Paradise Main Road in Westmoreland on Tuesday. 80-year-old landscaper Neville Houghton his 82-year-old wife, Iris, and their 35-year-old grandson, Conroy Beckford, died. Another grandson and his common-law wife, as well as their three-year-old daughter, received injuries and were all admitted to the Sablamar Hospital. The Sablamar police say shortly after 2 p.m., the family was returning home to St. James from their farm in Westmoreland in their grey Honda Stepwagon being driven by Beckford. 
On reaching a section of the Paradise Main Road, the right rear tire blew out, causing the driver to lose control. The vehicle ran off the road, overturned, and slammed into a large tree. And that's it for this edition of Jamaica Now, your weekly review of the big news stories. Send us your comments at onlinefeedback at gleanerjm.com. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Jamaica Gleaner and on Facebook at Gleaner Jamaica. Like this video on our YouTube page and subscribe today. I'm Damian Mitchell and before we go, remembering the media magnet, Oliver Frederick Clark.